Mariana, thank you again for coming. We're here, obviously, to talk about this book in particular, but I'd love just to, and I think it's really appropriate, right? Is it 52 years since the moon landing today? Just oh, I, thought, I thought you were going to say since I was born, because it is. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully this is not your birth. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, yeah, well, so, I mean, that that's partly why I chose to focus so much on Apollo, because we all take it for granted but we don't realize just how much kind of organizational redesign it required. And, you know, anyone like me who's interested in innovation will know that people talk about things like procurement and, you know, different types of loans for SMEs and so on. But actually what NASA did was not romanticize those notions. They actually deconstructed the current contracts and organizations they had in order to be purpose oriented. So I'm, I'm really keen actually to be having this conversation with you guys because of course Volans and, and the work of John around the triple bottom line has been so important for businesses to think about how to be more purpose oriented. So what does it mean for government organizations, public sector organizations, the civil service to be more purpose oriented for their own bureaucracies, their yeah. own way of doing things, but also how they work with business. Brilliant. So um, just before I, yeah, I wanted to check something. So before jumping in um, kind of deep, because I've, I've got um, I had a million post-it notes. And I was like, oh, this question, this question. So, <laughs> uh, we'll see how much I get to before we get um, inundated from from the chat. But um, so just checking in on how much did you actually know about the mission before you started? Very little. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say very little, but yeah. What I what I knew and what interested me about it, why I wrote about it, was that you know I I'm mainly so I'm an economist and I focus a lot on what in economics is called kind of industrial economics, innovation economics. I was very inspired by the work of Joseph Schumpeter and so on. But the way that policy is often framed in these areas is very sector specific, like you know quantum computing or AI, driverless cars. And what I knew about the moon landing is actually it required so many different sectors to innovate, collaborate, invest. And, and so many of the interesting things that happen happen kind of along the way serendipitously, right? You know, from camera phones to home insulation, you know, baby formula and, and so on. So I was very interested in kind of unpicking and looking much deeper at the moon landing in order for governments and businesses that are interested in talking about, you know, 21st century technology, the knowledge economy, you know, all the kind of, you know, usual talk we have around innovation to be much more grounded in kind of changes in the normal way that we do things in, in order to really inspire that cross-sectoral, cross-actor, serendipitous, you know, uh, 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 path towards actually achieving a big goal. And, you know, the sustainable development goals, which are like the big goals out there that people talk about, there, there isn't really like an ambitious, you know, mission oriented approach to get there. And so I kind of wanted to say, well, what got us to the moon and back? And can it be partly applied to the social goals we have? And of course, the answer is a bit. Um, and I tried to unpick the bit part. But of course, the societal goals we have today are so much harder than just getting to the moon. They're the you know, wicked challenges that require regulatory change and all sorts of changes, not just technological. But still, I was just interested in what actually happened. You know, like, what did they talk about? And I'm, I'm happy to tell you a bit of the like, yeah. really interesting things that they yeah. talked about. No, that sounds great because um, I'll, I'll rewind a little bit because I, I thought it was really interesting that you go, you know, quite deep on on that and some of the aerospace. My daughter wants to be an aerospace engineer, so I was like, oh. <laughs> oh. Um, so um, for those who haven't managed, I've actually had several WhatsApps today with people showing me they've they've done their homework and read the book. Oh yeah, um, but, but <laughs> the highlighters <laughs> and like stickums. I hope. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and for those who haven't, do you want to just in like three four sentences, if you can, what is the main tenet um, of the book? And by the way, if my hair is blowing, it's because I'm boiling. So I put a fan near me. So it's not so that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's tiny. It's this tiny fan, but it's actually having an effect, which is great. Um, so the main point of the book is that we should stop pretending things are easy. <laughs> right. So going to the moon is very hard. But the first thing they did was actually to admit that, that what, you know, remember Kennedy's speech, which was uh, we're going to do it because it's hard, not because it's easy. And so the main tenet of the book is if we are going to tackle the really difficult things we have, like climate change, global warming, but also this health pandemic. So, you know, making our health systems or global health systems more resilient, we're going to have to, first of all, admit it's going to be hard. <laughs> and we need to kind of welcome that risk taking, the uncertainty, 
the learning by doing along the way and not kind of blame the civil service as soon as they make one mistake. But also mm-hmm. we need to strengthen the civil service and not just kind of over consultify it. You know, you Valance, I guess yeah. you'd call yourself a consulting company. I don't For know. Sure. But my next book, by the way, is, is oh, I shouldn't tell you the title, but it's going to be unpicking yeah. the consulting model of capitalism. But anyway, that thing about investing within the dynamic capabilities of both public and private institutions so they can together really share risks, share rewards, but also invest, innovate from within, not Mm -hmm. just like what can government do for others to innovate. Government itself has to innovate from within in order to tackle climate change, in order to have more resilient health systems. So I wrote the book because I believe that it's impossible to have better policy around the SDGs, which I think we need, and we need better Mm -hmm. business structures as well. It's impossible unless we change our mindset and literally redesign the tools from scratch. And so by looking at the Apollo program and kind of, you know, looking at how seriously they took procurement and how they even had this clause of no excess profits, very interesting, (laughs) in terms of really getting a more mutualistic, not a parasitic public-private partnership, I just thought this is going to be a really interesting thing precisely because it was 50 years ago when I started writing it, Mm -hmm. Uh, 51 years ago that they landed on the moon, that I just don't think people have realized just what an organizational feat it was, not just kind of a, a technological one. No, and that's um, that's wonderful. And going uh, kind of, so you, obviously you're an economist and, you know, along with a couple of other powerful women like Kate Rayworth, Carlotta Perez, who you both, you quote them both, you're part of this new <laughs> wave. Of, of I am listening, I promise. I'm not texting John. <laughs> I know, I can do your texting John. Don't worry, we'll get to John's question. He's also said some in to me already, so don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I am listening. I can, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mother of four kids. I super multitask. I can be oh. texting John, listening to you. Getting and the fan. having a, a zip of your gin and tonic, I hope, as well. Um, the... So you are this new wave of economists. You know, when did you realize? Because I, I had, I, I'm in theory, I have an economics degree, um, and kind of decided that I really didn't want to go deeper in that. Um, when did you realize you were reinventing some of what was happening? Hmm, interesting. Uh, well, first of all, I was my first degree was in history. Uh and kind of political science at Tufts University. They had this Fletcher School of International Relations, kind of like the Kennedy School. And it was through my experience. This is actually kind of interesting. I don't know if you guys are interested. It's interesting if I think back to it. It was my work with trade unions in Boston that got me interested in the economy. Why? Because when I was doing university, which was back in, so from 1986 to 1990, I did my undergraduate degree in Boston. I'm Italian, but grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, wanted to get the hell out of Princeton. So I went to Boston, like the big city where I was you know, going to go. And I ended up at Tufts and all the people like me who were kind of progressive, you know, center left and interested yeah. in you know, making the world better, were all looking abroad. So at the time, they were all worried about apartheid. And you'll remember there was a big, um, there was lots of civil war in Central America Nicaragua, yeah. El Salvador, people worried about Contra yeah. Sandinistas. And I'm sitting there in Boston, which, you know, is, I think, still in a very uh, problematic city in terms of how ghettofied it is. It's actually very racist by job, like all hotel workers are, um, are you know, um, very kind of deprived and from particular communities. Um, and I got interested in work, like how is work structured and why is it that in Europe, Mm-hmm. You think that being part of a trade union is kind of normal. It's your right yeah. to organize. In the U.S., there's all these companies actually helping other companies keep out trade unions, right? There's like law firms and, and, and media companies actually helping uh, uh, the private sector keep unions out to um, basically prevent workers from organizing. And, you know, that word organizing, I recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to see the film Norma Ray, which unfortunately is not available in any platform. I'm trying to get my kids to watch it. So the kind of need to actually allow workers in factories, you know, in the old world, but in any sort of work environment to together decide, you know, alongside, uh, you know, capital, (laughs) uh, how to organize production. That's in theory what stakeholder capitalism is about. That's in theory what all the Davos talk about purpose. Exactly. In America, it's illegal in many parts of the country. Like there's, you know, closed shop, open shop, et cetera. Anyway, my experience in working with trade unions in Boston opened my eyes to how little I understood about the economy and specifically about kind of production issues. So I got very interested in on picking that, and I found myself looking at economics departments to do a kind of a master's and PhD, and decided to go to the only place in the world <laughs> that 
uh, teaches heterodox economics in a way that is not just like history of economic thought, like, oh, once upon a time, Marx said this, and then Keynes said that, yeah. and, you know, Ricardo said that, but the real theory is mainstream kind of economic, you, know, you know, neoclassical economics. They taught at the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research, which is where I went to do my PhD. It was founded by people who actually had left Germany during um, uh, the Nazi period, especially the Frank Frankfurt School in Germany. Yeah founded basically what then became the graduate faculty of the new school. There's philosophers, economists, and so on. And I benefited massively from my own economic training that I had literally the prima donnas in every single field of economic thought, <laughs> including neoclassical mainstream economics, but they were all taught as equally viable, different tools through which to understand the economy. Plus, because I started to get super interested in technological change that became sort of my focus, and I luckily had a very wonderful supervisor who said, well, if you're interested in kind of all the you know, nonlinearities and the kind of Schumpeterian kind of approach to economics, you need to go to the Santa Fe Institute for mm -hmm. one summer. I was the only woman on the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico program on complexity theory and economics. So I can tell you a very funny story, but I won't because that'll put me off track <laughs> about that. But anyway, and so that kind of focus on labor conditions, plus technological change and the impact it's had in the history of capitalism, plus new kind of methodological tools, mm -hmm. you know, quantitative tools, not from Newtonian physics, which is all the math that is in economics yes. is basically from Newtonian physics, you know, center of gravity, equilibrating forces and so on, but from say biology, um, you know, replicator dynamics, distance from mean dynamics and complexity theory, also in terms of like new agent-based modeling that I learned there, those three things together kind of form the person that I am. Um, and I think that's maybe the innovative bit, which is that I try to understand how innovation occurs as a collectively created process and how we've dismissed many actors in that process, like the mm -hmm. state, which isn't just facilitating and fixing markets, but has often in the history of capitalism been the kind of the lead innovator, taking the early stage high risk investments that are, you know, like the internet, yeah. GPS, touchscreen theory, blah, 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 that I read about in a previous book, but that what is then the theory of value and collective value creation that's required if we actually really understand all the different actors, not just business that create value. And secondly, what's the kind of, you know, um, practical way to make sure that we are not just socializing risks in the process, but really sharing the rewards that really benefited a lot from my experience with trade unions, which had labor kind of at the center but not in an, an ideological way, but really, again, in the way that in theory people at Davos talk about, but then don't actually do. I learned a lot from that. And, and I must say that some of the most interesting people I've met in my life have been trade union organizers because it's, it's a difficult battle. It is. In America, it's guerrilla warfare. <laughs> Thanks. It's so interesting. So I'm Danish, right? And I've grown up between Denmark and here. And again, like you, everybody's in a union. And if you're not, you're yeah. a little bit weird. <laughs> yeah, not in so, America. Land yeah. of the free. <laughs> so it, it's just... Free to be exploited. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, this is the thing, right? And so, because, yeah, so, so looking at it from the outside, I, you know, what are the traditional economists saying to you? You know, have you, have you had a hard time? Or is everybody doing what us lot, and I know everybody in the audience tonight are doing, is like, yes, this is it, let's go. Um, um, I mean, there's different answers to that. First of all, economics, because it's been so paranoid to show that it's more scientific than any other field, like anthropology and sociology, mm -hmm does what a lot of paranoid people do, which is like worry, right? Oh, you know, so I find that the, the economists in, in the mainstream kind of area that I've most spoken to are actually those who've kind of like won Nobel Prizes. So they're not paranoid. They're just kind of relaxed. They're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Talk to me. <laughs> Whereas those who are just worried about their like H factor yeah. and their citations, are like, oh no, she's a communist and we, you know, <laughs> she's going to make me look weird. I, first of all, I don't care about them. But second, it's like, that's where you get some of the most pushback, but I just kind of ignore that. Um, I think because I have been so interested, at least for the last 10 years, in changing uh, how we do capitalism, I've not really worried too much about what other academics think, even though I'm in academia, I've been given the amazing opportunity by UCL to set up my own department. How cool is that? So like when they headhunted me, um, I was at the time at Sussex at the Science Policy Research Unit, which for what I do is sort of like the place to be. And so when UCL said, please come to us and here's some you know, things we can give you. And I was like, well, what I really want is, and I started slowly 
saying I wanted a center. And I'm like, ah, screw the center. I want a department. (laughs) What you don't want is a center in a shitty department that forces you then to teach the wrong things. And you're just a little peripheral, weird Mm -hmm. thing within a, you know, tradition. So the fact they let me do that means that I'm in a super privileged position to rewrite the curriculum and literally to rewrite the textbook the kind of new economic thinking, not only for our undergraduate students, of which we just have one class called Rethinking Capitalism, which students from all over UCL take, but especially our main program, which is the Master's in Public Administration. You know, many, I'm sure, of your audience have done MBAs, um, Mm -hmm. Master's in Business Administration, which is very important. The top MBA schools in the world, you teach, you know, like strategic management, organizational behavior, decision sciences. We don't have that level of ambitious for our government workers. It's all like new public management, public choice theory that have basically convinced civil servants that, you know, at best they can fix a market failure. And guess what? Government failure is even worse than market failure. So please do your thing and then get the hell out of the way. Take as little space as possible. So there's no ambition. There's no intra-organizational investment in that kind of, you know, moonshot approach that I talked about. And there's fear of risk. And also it's kind of a boring place to work. So even though there's great people who work in the civil service, it's like notwithstanding the kind of bad environment, which is as soon as you make a mistake, you're blamed. So no one wants to make a mistake. And that's why we end up inviting PWCs to do the risk taking for government because everyone's scared of making a mistake. So there's no learning by doing, there's no like becoming a knowledge organization. And so that's what I'm focused on. And it's within an academic environment, which I should say, not only am I proud of, but I'm going to resist as much as I can to not have a little like consulting arm of the Institute, which is what Mm -hmm. people are telling us we should do because we're in massive demand to work with governments around the world and university budgets and structures are really inertial. (laughs) They're, you know, they make other government organizations look very dynamic. Um, But I think it's really important to remain in the university in order to reinvent what universities should be. I think they've just become really static organizations that no longer, you know, like the, the Mont yeah. Pelerin Society movement, which was a huge kind of like, you know, yeah. I would call a regressive movement, not a progressive movement, involved universities, journalists, the media, it was a whole cultural movement. I think we need the same thing today for the opposite, to have like the equivalent of the Mont Pelerin Society, but for the, for the good, yeah. <laughs> for the SDGs, yes. we need it to be a movement and universities to be part of that need to change how they work. And that's what I'm trying to do, to make academics think about practice-based theorizing. So you actually care about what happens on the ground. You don't just go lecture people about why austerity sucks. You actually help them create new institutions and bring that back to the theory. So it's a bit, yeah, action-driven, which I love. And your team has been growing as far as I can see. Can I can see people I know in other good organizations who are suddenly going, oh, I've now got a job here. So oh. <laughs> how, is that, how, how has that been through lockdown, everything with this growth that I'm seeing? And you clearly being incredibly busy. All good? Well, no, it's very hard to, on, I mean, but this is true for everyone, yeah. to onboard people on video. I actually had a wonderful chief of staff for the last year and a half, and then he had to go move abroad again. Um, and so totally different time zone. So it was going to be hard to work together. And I had never met him <laughs> physically. <laughs> um, and yet we talked every day, like six times. So um, it's just crazy that we've become used to that. And I think on the one hand, it's good. Like we've learned that we can actually, you know, do all sorts of different things because working at home is now not something you have to ask for, but it's seen as normal. On the other hand, it, I think we're all working too much. Cause like this zoom call I'm on now is on the back of like five zoom calls today. We don't even have time to go pee yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so, I did, I promise. Um, and I even got one of my PhD students that said, please make me a gin and tonic. Cause they said I should have one on this. And I showed her your WhatsApp. It says, it says I need a gin and tonic. Go make me one. <laughs> so glad. I'm so That's glad. why it's good to have PhD students in the building. <laughs> um yeah I I shouldn't say that publicly that would be called abuse of students (laughs) Um, they they got to drink it as well um so I I think it's very hard to be growing during lockdown because actually that human touch and the kind of random conversation you know in the hallway in the kitchen and so on which actually makes us all realize how difficult actually some of the things we're doing are um and not just you know celebrating the successes but kind of sharing experiences and so on that's just harder to do in zoom and you don't see someone this coach of one of my kids told me that the reason we're all tense is all the attention is here right you only see this bit whereas if i'm talking to you you'll see my my feet fidgeting and there's attention to i don't know someone's knees and shoes whereas all the attention is here and our 
our chest and our hearts and our necks are like stiff from that. I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Why is I'm cracking when I move? No, I, I keep saying to my team that actually the work, office used to be a place we would go to work. And now it's a place we go to work together. Um, mm because we're not, we haven't gone in full time and actually have to make sure that it's that interaction we get it rather than just sitting next to each other on yeah. a variety of calls or whatever. Right, let's dig into the book a little bit because this, as I said, there's so much and I can see questions are coming left, right and center. I will pick them up. Um, Sophie's putting them and kind of feeding them through to me. So I'm hoping that this is gonna work. Um, the, um, um, let's Let's start with, the purpose piece, because as you said, you know, purpose, we've got the SDGs on a big scale. We've got purpose popular with, with companies more and more. Um, and, and when we look at, you know, at transforming companies, which is what we do, um, I wouldn't call us consultants quite, but you know, we, we help advise around how do you, how do you transform towards a purpose and a bigger purpose? There is, um, there is collaboration um, and, and this collaboration for regeneration seems to require, as far as we can see, and we're doing some work in Scotland, actually, that I think, you know, a couple of questions about Scotland too, yeah. um, with the Leaving Programme, where they're trying to bring regeneration, not just environmental, but bringing a river back to life, but also social and economic. And that takes collaboration across public sector, private sector, NGOs, education, and so on. Um, if you flip it to the company side though and I know that's not your, the focus of your book but mm -hmm. the um how important do you think that is that companies are now starting to state societal purposes you know um that whole stakeholder capitalism that the Davos guys are talking a lot about and not doing that much about um yeah. is you know is it enough that a public organization at the center of a mission has a has that bigger purpose and can bring people along to it or do the private companies need to have them too so definitely you also need the private sector but i think it's how so currently even in the U, uh, in the uk all the talk is about like business friendly policies and i think mm -hmm. the least friendly thing you can do for business is just talk about being business friendly because you're probably going to do some really progressive thing which brings some businesses and not others so it's not generic it's, it's not kind of generally business friendly it's just like sucking up to particular <laughs> businesses and probably a policy that you know doesn't actually have any effect so what, what I think we need is both mission-driven government institutions and purpose-oriented private institutions, but that notion of purpose that needs to be at the center of the public-private um, relationship. And what I mean by that is, I mean, again, coming back to the moon landing, what was so interesting to me was, first of all, how many different companies were involved in the moon landing? There was, you know, hundreds. Um, and lots of different sectors. It wasn't just aerospace, it was nutrition, materials, electronics, you know, software basically happened through that in terms of the software industry, how we know it today and the kind of small computing uh, capability within the lunar module that, you know, before that was all mainframes. So what was interesting to me is that in order to collaborate with the private sector, um, NASA actually ended up paying a lot of, of attention to the contracts. And, and that's like a purposeful contract, a social contract is what I think stakeholder capitalism should be about. It can't just be about a discussion within corporate governance. It has to be about the governance of systems and ecosystems and partnerships. And partnerships you'll know from marriage. I don't know how many people here are <laughs> married or in a partnership of some sort. And you'll know also from speaking to your friends or seeing Hollywood movies, there's abusive partnerships <laughs> and there's you know better partnerships and ecosystems. If you speak to a biologist, you know they'll tell you it can be predator prey, it can be parasitic, it can be mutualistic, mm. it can be symbiotic. So I think this idea of mutualistic and symbiotic partnerships requires kind of purpose at the center. And what NASA did in order to build that at the time, I think actually we have less of that in NASA today, and we can get to John's question later, unpick the procurement contracts, which was just one of the types of contracts they had, from being cost plus contracts, which were easily gained by the private sector, to be fixed price contracts, where the fixed price was almost like a prize scheme. There was a prize, you know, for businesses to sort out one of the hundreds of problems that need to be sorted, but with constant incentives for innovation and quality improvement. And they also had a, a clause within the contract of no excess profits. So this is not going to become a gambling casino. This is a collectively created space, literally outer space, and we're going to, you know, share in the rewards and not kind of, you know, cheat each other. 
And so that needed to be in the contract. It doesn't just happen naturally by going to the World Economic Forum. And I think that's what we need more of today, which is to unpick the faulty contracts, because a lot of these are actually you know, legal contracts, but it's not just about the, the law, but it is actually part of it, you know, because we have to govern the relationships in a different way. And if you look at the vaccine today with for COVID, it's a perfect place to start, which is you have, you know, companies like Pfizer, AstraZeneca, first of all, we're calling these vaccines by the company name, which mm -hmm. is good because these are massive amounts of public investment as well. Um, you know, the Oxford scientists are all working in public universities. People in America forget that, you know, Harvard, Yale and Princeton are private, Oxford and Cambridge are public. The Oxford scientists actually took care, unlike the, the Pfizer vaccine, to make sure that the costs and the prices remained reasonable. They were also much more careful around the intellectual property rights. And intellectual property rights, unfortunately, are called rights. They're not rights, they're contracts. You give, the government is giving a private sector company 20 years of monopoly profits. That's not given from God, it's given to you by the state. Government, In exchange yeah. for 20 year monopoly profits, you should be you know, having to do certain things. For example, even the, the patent itself should not be abusive. It should not be extractive. Patents work when they are uh, weak, so easy to license. They are not too wide, which they currently are, because patents are often used for um, strategic reasons, just to keep people out of your general neighborhood. And they're way too upstream today. So we're actually allowing the tools for research to be patented. And that's mm. not what patents should be for. They should be much more downstream. So if you have you know, patents that are too upstream, too, too wide and too strong, that leads to what William Baumol, a wonderful ex, um, well, he, he is no longer living, uh, and he actually was quite mainstream. But anyway, he, he called the abuse of patents leading to unproductive entrepreneurship or what in my book on value i call yeah. rent you know basically yeah. rent it's yeah, rent absolutely. so um, that means re like unconstructing the relationship between business and the state to be more purposeful to be more symbiotic less parasitic and less extractive and i don't think that's the conversation that's currently being had with stakeholder value yeah. it's, it's just I, a corporate governance I, conversation. yeah completely right i think your your mic is sometimes um rubbing and getting something just fyi oh. So we were getting a little bit of blur at some point. Not sure what it was. Just sure. FYI. Just no, no, it's fine. Excellent. I just I wanted everybody to hear clearly what you're saying. Yeah, it might be my no. fan. Oh, oh, oh yeah, we will, but we want you to keep the fan on, Mariana. I really don't want you to melt before our eyes, which is what I would be doing. I know you've got, you know, Italian, but still. The um um, so it's really interesting because the you know, you talked about social contracts in the beginning of, of, of that and one of the things I've been thinking, you know, so I come from Denmark, social contract feels very real um, and, and very agreed, most of the time at least. And, and similarly, you've done substantial work in Scotland around, you know, which has that sense of social uh, contract at the core. Do you think it's even possible in bigger countries like the UK or even bigger to the US to, to bring in a uh, kind of sort of invoke a social contract? Is it that we yeah. need to, to localize more or no? I mean, it's like the discussion currently being had, at least in the US around the Green Deal is much more ambitious than in the UK, at least. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. You know, or even with COVID-19 um, right now, it's interesting when you look at countries like Austria, Denmark, um, actually Scotland had this too. There's been conditions attached to the bailout funds yeah. So in France, the conditions set for both Air France and Renault mm -hmm. to access French COVID recovery was they had to lower their carbon emissions, Yes, uh, which is normal. Like it shouldn't just be during COVID. It should just be like normal. Like you're not going to just get a public loan, just, you know, do whatever the hell you want, which is what we did with EasyJet here. It was just a bailout, you know, during yeah. the COVID, you know, 600 million for here for free, just go kind of do your thing. Um, and so this kind of condition-free access to public support, guarantees, subsidies, and so on is the first thing I think we should change. And what we're seeing with COVID-19 is there's huge heterogeneity between countries, and it's not about their size, it's actually about the willingness and desire to get the deal of the Green Deal you know, done. Because the green right. bit, as, as Greta Thornburg always says, just listen to the science, it's true. I mean, the green bit is not exactly rocket science. We kind of know what needs to be done, but the deal, that's social science. That means literally deconstructing the social contract. And so it's interesting that Elizabeth Warren, for example, already with the, um, what was it called? The, uh, it was pre-Biden. It was when Trump also had the US CARE Act. It was a coronavirus yes. relief um, act. She argued that companies in order to access the, the what is now a, a massive um, 
uh, bailout and, and recovery program should not be allowed to just do these massive share buybacks. And you'll know that S&P 500 companies have over the last 10 years engaged oh. in a $4 trillion share buyback scheme. And so that's a lack of reinvestment. And if you look at back at the U.S., model in the early days when, as, as I saw one of the questions, also looking back at the kind of the World War II days, in the early days in the US, the government was so much more confident. So for example, Bell Labs, which you'll all know is a really successful and important um, private sector R&D laboratory inside AT&T, came about in a period where in order to retain its monopoly status, AT&T had to, as part of the deal, the monopoly deal, reinvest its profits, not hoard it, not you know, some sort of scheme like today's share buybacks. They had to reinvest in the real economy into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. Bell Labs was the answer. Yeah. So the, the kind of share buyback explosion is not just about you know, purpose and the Davos discussion about intra-organizational governance around ESGs. It's also about the deal. Yeah. You should have more deals. And if you look at them, you know, look at pharmaceutical companies in the US, they get access to 40 billion a year in health innovation funds from the National Institutes of Health. There's no deal. So the patents are a bad deal. The prices of the drugs that also are coming out of this collective value creation don't reflect that public contribution. So there's lots to learn, even from US history, um, lots of interesting examples across Europe, but it's not about like the perfect country. It usually tends to happen when there was a, a, a phase where there was confidence that this really was truly about doing something together and the deal had to represent that collective um, you know, creation yeah. instead of pretending. And just, I'll pick up on that one. And then, um, so I see Gloria has just posted that the Bell Labs used to release inventions into the wild without p patents. Yeah. Anything like that happening today that you know of? Well, sectors have always been quite different one from the other. So in pharmaceuticals in general, they tend to use patents much more, say, than in software. But if you look at um, the pressures now, I mean, I, I've just set up a new council. Well, I was asked to set up a council by Dr. Tedros and the World Health Organization. Uh, it's called the uh, Council on the Economics of Health for All. And one of the things we're writing about is that it's not just about like the, you know, the, the, the TRIPS waiver and the, and the kind of, uh, you know, um, patent waiver that is being called for around the vaccine that's important now because what we really want is global access to this vaccine. But it actually, you know, the problem starts earlier, which is how, why have we allowed, you know, um, a patents to be abused? Because I, I, I don't think the problem is the patents themselves. So yes, yeah. I, I mean, Gloria's right. In some sectors, there have been no patents because there's other ways to appropriate the knowledge, including secrecy in some sectors, it's easier to do secrecy or the learning curve is so steep that just being first gets you down yeah. that competitive track. And so it's less important about the patents, but that's more a sector specific difference. But the intra-sector differences in, the, in how patents are used often comes down to, um, you know, what is sort of allowed and what the battle is. There's like social movements that have called for a different type of patenting, just like social movements have kind of gotten us the green revolution. You know, Germany, which in many cases has, in many ways has led globally around green is because there was also a big green movement and a green party. Mm -hmm. um, so we shouldn't forget that capitalism in history has often become better form of capitalism because of social movements. You know, we all have the weekend, the eight hour workday because of labor unions, which I began my you know, talk with you today about, but there's also Fridays for the Future, BLM, the Me Too movement, you know, mm -hmm. labor struggles today, all of these shouldn't be seen as peripheral. as this kind of noise on the outside in the history of capitalism is actually what made it better. And we yeah. all benefit from weekends, even though trade unions fought for them. We all benefit from, you know, better environmental regulations, but people fought for that. And I think getting IPR to work better is increasingly becoming a social movement because we no longer accept that you have what Dr. Tedros calls, you know, vaccine apartheid. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it's going to be interesting to see if it's a wake up call around that theme. It'd be really interesting. I look forward to seeing what comes out of that. I'm going to pick up on Paul. Paul Haney actually sent three questions in before we even started. So yesterday. So he gets to, to have at least one read out, I think. Um, it's about the... Um, government having lost confidence to act, which you say, and in what he says is, you say that they've lost confidence to act and the capability to act. Do you think that root cause for this is at least partly 
attributable to the Freedom of Information Act. So a staggering amount of government action um, is available for very close scrutiny by the public and the media. So leading to staggering amount of criticism, leaving the government again, damned if they do, damned if they don't. And a convenient way to deflect this is by doing very little other than passing sort of meaty activities on, onto the PwCs and the larger consulting companies. And this tactic would have three benefits. One, defense, we, you know, we called in the biggest and the best. What more could we have done? Two, lots of scope for cronyism. <laughs> three, which we've seen, um, and allows the blame to be directed onto large consulting companies when something goes wrong, as they often seem to. And I can see Adam Lerner has put something in that's very similar in the chat as well. That's, I mean, I'm sure all that is true. And, and I've, I've heard people, you know, talk about those particular changes like Freedom of Information Act is influencing that, but I don't think alone that would have caused the change that we've seen. You know, as, as Obama once said, the last time we had a massive reorganization of government was in the age of black and white TV. Um, um, so I think the kind of lack of even investment within our civil service, within what I call the kind of dynamic capabilities of the public sector. And if we have time, I'll tell you why I call it that briefly, because that <laughs> actually is, well, the dynamic capabilities of the firm, that concept and the influence it had in the management literature was because we remember like Porter's five forces framework. Oh, yeah. It was all what was outside of the firm. Right. And then you needed people like David Teese, but really building on the work of Edith Penrose, a wonderful uh, woman economist back in the early uh, 19th century. Um, I think she was, was, was she 1930s that she was writing. Um, that kind of made people realize that, you know, this issue of core competencies and that kind of development of the, what, what she called the resource-based theory of the firm, which looked inward and not external, became a huge kind of change in how we thought about not just management, but in some ways it also affected the you know, microeconomic understanding of, of production. We never had that with government because we think that government is there just to be this kind of bureaucratic thing of at best fixing market failures and at worst getting kind of captured along the way. So do as little as you can and just kind of, you know, level the playing field so that the funky players can do their thing. Um, then there's no reason to, to invest within. And one of the investments you need to do within in terms of these dynamic capabilities of the public sector, just like you need dynamic capabilities of the firm, but everyone knows that because we admit that government creates value. That's the first bit, which is we need a new theory of value, hence my previous book called The Value of Everything. Yeah. We need a different theory of value to even justify why government needs those capabilities, of which one of them is, in fact, the ability to kind of welcome uncertainty and to welcome experimentation and to learn from failure. It's, it's not just, hey, don't worry about failure, just like the VCs brag about every failure because for every success that they have, like, you know, Kleiner Perkins with Genentech, they had to undergo lots of failures yeah. along the way. Well, that's not enough to say fail. You need to learn from the failure. And if you're not investing in your ability to learn by doing, you're just going to fail, period. And you should worry about that. So, so I think that's been my focus. And I think that's been since the 1980s with, you know, kind of Chicago school kind of economics, the, the branch of that within the kind of public sector world was, as I mentioned before, new public management and public choice theory which basically said government failure is even worse than market failure. Government officials are also just like firms are maximizing their profits. Government officials are maximizing their ability right. to win the next election. So we'll always just be doing, you know, whatever is good for them, self-serving and might again, get captured and corrupted along the way. And that's like the, the most depressing view of oh. what government <laughs> is for. Um, but I see it even in Europe. I mean, you mentioned you're from Denmark and Scandinavia. I mean, I work quite a bit with um, Scandinavian uh, organizations like Vanova in Sweden, Citra in Finland, and so on. And even in those countries, I feel like there's been a, a bit of a decimation of what the public sector is for. So, so Citra, for example, used to be, for those who don't know Citra, it's a public innovation kind of agency yeah. within the uh, Finnish government. It used to also be an investment fund. And it was actually really important for Nokia's revival back at when Nokia phones came back, right? Because they were around actually for, for many, many years before that. But what when we all became aware of Nokia, yeah, yeah. Well, early um, it actually received a lot of public money in the early kind of phase yeah. of that, exactly. And that wouldn't have happened without that kind of patient high-risk public finance. And then, you know, as it became successful, it crowded in all sorts of other 
finance. The fact that later then had a bad business model, that's not yeah. <laughs> the government's <laughs> fault. But C-Truck increasingly is being pressured to just become like a think tank, kind of like Nesta here. Yeah. And so this idea, you know, whereas, for example, in Israel, you know, even though it's called Startup Nation, I don't think people realize just how important Yasma, public venture capital fund, has been to Israeli startup companies. So that kind of early stage, high risk patient, not impatient finance has been very important in Israel. And that came from the public sector and that occurred through investment. But how do you make sure that that investment is not just putting all one's eggs in one basket and kind of making you know random decisions based on some ministers or public mm-hmm. officials kind of choices, but actually really about redirecting an economy? And that's what I write about. I say that, of course, you shouldn't be tilting the playing, sorry, leveling the playing field. You should be tilting it but not by making choices on one sector, one technology, one firm, but making very bold choices about the direction and doing everything you can with grants, loans, and port and procurement to kind of set up a portfolio of different types of investments that kind of get you there, of which some will fail. And so the next step is how do you make sure that the ones that fail are, are are not the only ones that you're picking up the pieces on? So the example I often give is Tesla and Solyndra, were both in the same portfolio of the US government after the financial crisis, because they wanted the 800 billion stimulus program to be green directed. And somehow the taxpayer ended up bailing out Solyndra, which got 500 billion, sorry, a million from the US government and a guaranteed loan. And Tesla, which got more or less the same amount, you know, oh, that's Elon Musk, because he's such a genius. And even though Obama had all these Goldman Sachs guys in government, he somehow came up with a stupid thing where he told Elon Musk, um, this is part of the answer to you, John, uh, Elon Musk, who, by the way, has gotten over $5 billion from the U.S. government for his different companies, and even more than that, if you look at the, on the space side, much more than that. Yeah. Um, he said to Elon Musk, if you don't, well, the Department of Energy said, if you don't pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company. And of course, they did pay back the loan in 2013 because it's a good company. You know, why would you want a shitty yeah. company's shares because they're not paying back the loan? A good company, you know, you had the they retained three million shares, which is what Obama yeah. said. If they failed, the price per share went from nine to ninety, and the um, I hope yeah. my thing doesn't go off. It says I need to put in my thing for Edu Rome. Anyway, am I still here? You're still here. Okay, good. We got you. Um, the price per share went from nine to 90 multiplied by 3 million would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss in the next round of investments. So that kind of public venture capital role is not just about the investments you make, but also how do you make sure you're not just picking up the mess, but sharing in the rewards as any venture capital is. I I love that you go into that in the book for anybody who hasn't read the book yet, go buy it and and read that bit because that's one of the, I I think really interesting pieces. I'm just going to pick up that I can see Ran has just come in with the questions about values being a common theme. And he says, I'm interested in the value management concept, usually called value engineering in construction. Can it be used as a way to look at the comparative value between social, environmental and economic impacts rather than everything being reduced to, to dollars as part of the assessment and decision making process? That's okay. a really good point. And, and one of the um, things that we're doing with different governments in the world is precisely thinking, how do you value what you've done? It's not just like having these kind of, you know, moonshot and mission oriented policies around health, um, climate change and all the SDGs beneath, you know, beneath the SDGs, which are challenges. You need these kind of moonshots that get all these sectors, but how do you then value whether what you've done was kind of worthwhile and using cost benefit analysis and net present value would have stopped any kind of (laughs) (laughs) landing ambition from the start, but also so much of what happened uh, to get to the moon happened, again, serendipitously, huge amounts of, of, innova- of innovation across many sectors, camera phones, scratch-resistant lenses, CAT scans, water purification systems, and so on. So how do you capture these dynamic spillovers that happen across an economy when you're trying to be really ambitious and purposeful? And um, we actually tried to get the UK government to rewrite their green book which is all about kind of evaluating through cost benefit to consider these dynamics, intersectoral spillovers. And that that was about two years ago. And and on the back of that, they actually have started to think about some of these things because Greg Clark then worked very closely with us um, around this kind of notion of missions. And the next question was, how do you evaluate your success in a way that is much more, you know, looking at these kind of complexity theory points that I raised before and less about the kind of linear static view of, you know, invest here and get result there. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And that actually that brings up a, a, a point. I'm going to just take half of a question from Adam about what it's really for me is about time scale. Um, what gives you confidence that the existing public institutions can be reformed quickly? And I'm going to say quickly enough. And we all know what that deadline is <laughs> for, uh, to be kind of fit for purpose. How do we how do you do that faster? Because, you know, yeah. So I don't, so I have, I mean, maybe I'm just an optimist. I don't think the problem is the public organizations changing. It's why should they change? So unless we treat as urgently our social problems as we treat our wartime problems or even our technological problems, you know, setting up a whole kind of, you know, DARPA type outfit to go after quantum computing, that tends to have almost no debate. We do it. But if you said the same thing around social housing, like let's get really ambitious around different types of activities around the welfare state and poor innovation funding to rethinking our kind of welfare state, you know, like that's like, oh, well, we don't have any money for that. Right. So I think mm-hmm. that's the first thing, which is let's start treating as urgently our social and societal challenges as we tend to treat our kind of militaristic and technological problems. That's going to require government to change like that. And in mm-hmm. fact, we see that, right? I mean, Italy, again, where I'm from, has the most inertial procurement policy ever. And because it actually needed to procure in personal protection equipment, of which it was 100% dependent on China for when COVID struck, within three months, they became 100% independent. <laughs> uh, so so uh, how do you say, uh, in, sorry, 100% independent, yeah, that's the word, yeah. um, of, of their own competence with 137 you know, companies procuring you know, all this stuff for for the um, Italian uh, people um, that happened through a a redesign that happened literally, I don't want to say overnight, but in a very short period because they had to. Whereas Mm. in normal timescales, because we think social problems and healthcare is not as important as, you know, winning World War II, we we think, oh, it's never going to happen. You know, Italy is so bureaucratic. It's never going to happen. Well, it happened. Um, so that's going to lead me because I'm suddenly realizing we have about six minutes left. Oh, my God. Um, the, to, I always ask, um, so, you know, what can we do, I guess? So, so right, I'll come back to some other questions if we have time. But just to make government public policy think that this is urgent enough, what would you like everybody on this call to, to do or convince somebody else to do for that matter? So who's on the call? <laughs> so, oh, is it all people no, so I can tell you some other people. So we have yeah. got, <laughs> we have, we have got. I'm gonna look now. I'm gonna change my view. So okay, obviously, so- some brilliant academics. We've got some amazing social um, entrepreneurs. We've got uh, climate kick people. We've got uh, people working in insurance. We've got uh, Terry, who's the CEO of um, CEPA, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. We've got some consultants. Um, I'm looking who else. It's do okay I to be a consultant. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> anyway, and Gloria, you're not a, an absolutely nobody, but your students, you know, all of us, yeah. really. Um, so the reason I asked you is precisely if, if, if you have that kind of crowd, which is wonderful because it's kind of in some ways all walks of life, I think what's really needed is to find an area and to sandbox it. Like there's, you know, we've all talked the talk about, you know, purpose or even missions. Now it seems like it's a new household word amongst policymakers. And yet we still get the vaccine wrong. (laughs) The (laughs) governance of the vaccine wrong. There's no point in having a vaccine if it's not globally accessible. Um, And so it'd be really interesting to get an area, whether it's like the digital divide, health, uh, you know, uh, climate, and to unpack what it actually means for all these different actors that you just mentioned to work together in a different way. But what that requires is first to map out how in problematic areas these different groups are working and to literally unpack the contract and say, oh, let's look at what it would actually look like to have, you know, uh, as ambitious as a no excess profits clause. And it's not just about the excess profits because that's that was just interesting to me that they even cared about that. And by the way, it was excess profits. What excess means is earning in excess of what you're doing, right? I mean, if, if you're really sharing risks, then why aren't all the risk takers yeah. getting a share of the profits? And it's all kind of going to this one very skewed area. So experimenting like NASA found itself experimenting from going to cost plus contracts, the fixed price ones with incentives for innovation, the no excess profits, but also something they really cared about, which is so interesting to me, where the head of procurement said, if, unless we invest within our own like brain, we're going to get captured 
by brochuremanship because they didn't have the consultancies doing PowerPoints at the time. They had brochures. The brochures. And, they're like, <laughs> and, and they're like, we're not going to know who to partner with. We won't know how to write the terms of reference with the private sector. And we need to work with the private sector. Of course, it's going to be a huge amounts of private initiative and innovation that's going to get us to the moon, but we won't know who to partner with or how to partner with them. What what we would call the loss of absorptive capacity for those academics on the call who might know some of the management literature. And, and it, like you might remember when Dell computers back in the day um, stopped kind of really investing in, in kind of innovation. It just was started to kind of supply, yeah. you know, different yeah. parts. I mean, uh, they're I basically remember. just putting stuff together that already existed. Some of the l- management literature thought about that as potential loss in absorptive capacity. So if you stop doing any R&D, you won't even understand what's around you. So that's going to be a short-term kind of benefit that you're going to have just by kind of sourcing in the parts, but you're going to become stupid and lose your competitiveness. And we need to think like that also with government, but with all organizations. So I think finding an area, maybe the digital divide, I think now with the lockdown, I've got four kids and they continue to have access to their you know, human rights education, but so many kids in London, in the UK, in Europe, in the world, definitely in Africa, definitely in Latin America, don't have access to their human right to education when they're locked at home because the access that they have to digital technology is so much weaker. What would it look like to have a zero digital divide kind of mission and bring together all these different actors that you just mentioned together on that kind of project and to sandbox it to mm-hmm. learn how to do things differently in terms of literally the relationships, but also the intra-organizational governance issues, and then to say, let's start scaling this up across the board. And unless we experiment in, you know, on specific kind of areas, then it's all just blah, 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 and we don't actually create change in the structures. Yeah, which is that. Can I just have thumbs up in your reaction box if you are all going to help do that, as Mariana suggested? If you can find your reaction buttons. Are we getting them? There you go. We've got oh. an army <laughs> going. There we are. Uh, um, oh, you muted yourself. Hang on. Something happened. Mute. There we go. Ah. I, was, I was saying I was, I'm going to do a screenshot of you all. There yeah. Oh, can we, have the, <laughs> we need the thumbs, some, thumbs up again if you're on for it. <laughs> or something else. You can do a heart or whatever. Uh... I are. like screenshots. I, th- I think we should all make posters with like all the, you know, like all the screenshots of the thousands of Zoom calls we've been on for the last year. <laughs> Get some yeah. artists to put them all together and uh, some global I art know. piece. <laughs> I love this one in particular because it is so diverse and there's so many questions that we haven't quite got to. I think we've touched on most things um, as we run up to the half, half past mark. Um, <sighs> I have one kind of question that I'm desperate to ask you, Will, which is one of the things that I'm obsessing about at the moment is, is do you think that we need to train a public sector differently? Or do you think we, as Dominic Cummings said in the UK, you know, hire different weirdos and misfits mm. in that aren't happening now? Um, first of all, by the way, any of you that are in the private sector who are interested in getting involved in this mission-oriented approach, I'm working with governments all over the place and asking exactly that. How, to, how do you work with business differently and around you know, clim- uh, plastic-free ocean, carbon-neutral city, zero digital divide, and so on? So do get in touch. Um, so Dominic Cummings actually asked me into um, Downing Street when he was still around and said, I read your book, love it. And this was the entrepreneurial state. Okay. Um, which is that whole kind of, you know, DARPA thing that then yeah. he obsessed about. And the first thing yeah. I said to him was like, well, you're part of the problem, right? Like anyone who's constantly dismissing the civil service, why would you want to go work in it? Mm-hmm. So in the US, they never said, you know, these kind of DARPA, SBIR, NIH, they never said, oh, let's bring geeks into government. They just had really big ambitions of what was needed. And it was an honor to go work in government. You know, so the way that Obama convinced Steve Chu a Nobel prize winning physicist to come in in 2009 and run the DOE was not because he said, Oh, I need a nerd. Hello there. Any nerds want to come in and be a, (laughs) a, you know, run the DOE? No, he said, we're going to direct a stimulus program. We're going to have a stimulus program. Thank you very much. Which Europe forgot to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, We blamed, you know, like we basically forgot that the financial crisis was due to private sector debt and just decided to cut public Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but, but Obama decided to direct the stimulus originally around green. He wanted mm-hmm. to have a real green transition. Back then, there, there's a whole book about that, actually, that's quite interesting, called The 
the new New Deal or the Green New Deal, I can't remember. Anyway, so that was really great, right? For a Nobel Prize winning physicist who was directing all his energy around, you know, well, around energy and physics to then be the DOE head in a period where 800 billion in a stimulus program was gonna help foster at the time they thought an energy revolution. The first thing he did, Steve Chu, was to set up ARPA-E because he knew that that kind of organizational competence was needed. So when you lack the vision of what the hell government is for, when you have no ambition around a green anything or sustainable Mm -hmm. anything or inclusive anything, you don't need innovative government. You don't need geeks in government. And so I told Dominic, I said, you know, unless you, First, tell me what the hell you're trying to do, what government's for, and tell me you care about the SDGs or inclusion, sustainability. Like, what's your vision? There's no point in setting up a DARPA or, an, or now an ADIA or this, that, the other. So you have to start with the vision, just like a private sector company would. Like, yes, what's the point of having, you know, like, what are you trying to do? <laughs> and so it, it was almost like he was obsessing about, like, one part of the process while at the same time, constantly blaming the bureaucrats for everything. So again, that kind of like, you know, feeling like, like you're always the problem saying you need geeks into government, but for what? And, and the fact there was no for what, whereas Cameron at least talked about being the greenest government ever. I mean, nothing happened, but at least there was a bit of that talk. Um, whereas under, under Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings, it's been about Brexit. I mean, that's the yeah. only vision I've heard. Yeah, what else no, no, no. absolutely. And it comes back to, for me, one of the big things I took away was, value and purpose right that that that's where we have to start and we have to decide what's our common what are our common values what do we want to value and what is the purpose of our society and then the government that's set up to run it Mariana, yep. we've now gone over time nobody has jumped off which is very unusual normally people are very um uh, sort of ready to go at that the time they are um but i will call it now there there are extra questions we'll send you all of them just so okay. you have, should you should you fancy um there is there'll be a a little summary going out with also this video so that would be um fun for everybody to see cool. and they can get in touch with you or come via the volunteer team and we'll send you everybody on there should be lots of good people here to to help make some of these missions a success right. thank you for your time i hope you get back to your cool house rather than your hot office very shortly. <laughs> I can get there somehow. Yeah. I came here with an Uber bike and almost died because I had these new Bose soundproof earphones blasting music. And I forgot that's not a good thing to do when you're on a bike in London. <laughs> hot in <laughs> London traffic. No. <laughs> so anyway. be safe. And thank, thank you, you everyone. Much. Thanks everyone for staying on. Bye-bye.